Yeah, I, had so. been, I had been in Portland with Harvey's Comedy Club, and I thought that made me hot stuff. And I found out in short order, you're beginning in Vegas. Get used to it. <laughs> so, yeah. Which is great. Everybody should learn that when they move. Just be patient. You know, yeah. they come, come from another city and they think that anything in their past matters. No, you're going to you're going to get in line. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much true. Uh, definitely true. That's that's how it works. It yeah, makes... it's called yeah. like respect. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go share this on your Instagram right now and then I'll come say hello to everybody at home and anybody that might be watching. Oh, awesome. Robbie Aces. I'm so happy you're here today, man. Yeah, um, thanks again for uh, inviting me. And, you and I, was, yeah, I, was, I was looking at that. You were on top of your stuff because because you had that scheduled out. Um, yeah, we when was that? That was August. That, yeah, that, uh, that we talked about it. So you are uh, professional with line, with a line in your show up. I definitely want to give you hats off for that. Oh, thank you. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have forgotten people and gotten a phone call. Uh, are you ready to give me my Zoom link? <laughs> like, uh oh. So I had to find a way that is foolproof. I just shared it on your Instagram right now. Cool. Or maybe I just shared it on. Wait a minute. Sorry, everybody, but this is new to me, and you know how it is for us people that are almost old. <laughs> I could guarantee you you're way, way more functional with, with this than, than me. Uh, so <laughs> I'm okay, sending you the link, and I also posted it on my Instagram, so you can find it in two places. Cool. So it should be... Uh, yeah, I, I can't make it live on your face, on your Instagram. No worries. I will see if I can figure figure out how to do that. Maybe uh, you can do point. that while I'm doing your intro and to intro to the show. That'll take me a couple minutes here, or you can do it later. Facebook people at home, Facebook people right here where I can't see you till later because I don't know why. <laughs> I just go with it. I never know who's here watching and the chats never show up. So please be patient with us to get back to you after every interview. So I'm Linda Marcus Smith, the host of Comic Spot Interviews. Today it's interview number 806. And I'm so happy we have somebody amazing, a very, very intelligent comedic mind. You're gonna love him. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. That's a teaser. So for right now, I want to say hello to my one sponsor, the comedian, the veterans of comedy. So if you ever want to give someone who has served for our country and is now serving up jokes, go to Will C or Will Clifton and veteransofcomedy.com and check out all the veterans of the military who are doing comedy around the world. They have a motto to leave no laugh behind, and they really care about bringing healing comedy to the veterans so and the other groups of people that meet. So hit them up, veteransofcomedy.com. Now, for what we came here to do, OMG, today we have somebody that is, I met him standing in line at an open mic. He just reminded me at Rebar that no longer exists for comedy. But before the pandemic, we met in line, getting ready, getting ready to sign up for an open mic at the Rebar Lounge in the Arts District of Las Vegas. And from the minute I locked eyes with him, I knew you gotta watch this guy. This guy is a contender. And then I saw him on stage. You guys, this guy's mind blows me away. And the way he delivers, he's like, to me, he's like a young Woody Allen, you know? And I don't say that lightly. I'm not talking about the Woody Allen we all know today. I'm talking about the young Woody Allen who showed his brilliance 
And that's what I see in Robbie Ace is our guest today. Say hi, Robbie. Hey, thanks so much. Yes, let me do your intro. Be here. We'll... Yeah, thank you so much for taking time. Oh my gosh, I'm delighted you're here. Let me read what his intro is. As you know, I ask every, everybody for a braggy intro. So it's not his style, but I made him. Robbie, a Rob, Robbie Aces, Acevedo, Acevedo? Yep, Acevedo. Yep. Acevedo is a road comic. That means a working paid comedian, not like an open micer. Rob, Robbie Aces, Acevedo. Yep. Acevedo is a road comic who got his start in improv and sketch at Upright Citizens Brigade. Oh my gosh. And People's Improv Theaters and The Magnet in New York City before transitioning to stand up. He performs as part of Heron Entertainment's brewery and winery tours, comedy tours all over the country. Oh my gosh. Some intros deserve to be read twice he just all over the country and writes for the las vegas sketch group called the classy hooligans who can be seen on youtube this is the coolest coolest intro ever and i know i messed it up by stopping so i'm going to read it again it deserves it <laughs> rob robbie ace is acevedo is a road comic who got his start in improv and sketch it the upright citizens brigade and people's improv theaters and the magnet in new york city before transitioning to stand up he performs as part of Huron entertainment's brewery and winery comedy tours all over the country and writes for the las vegas sketch group called the classy hooligans who can be seen on youtube and now, enough about me getting in the way. Let's get to know Robbie Aces. Woo! Hi, Robbie. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. You, you did good. You did. You, you put a lot of flair into that. I, I, I felt the drama and everything. Like, <laughs> you, 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 uh, you pulled out all the stops with, with, uh, with your delivery skills. You did, <laughs> did an awesome job. By the way, the, uh, the, where where you're I now I have this uh, I have this fake uh, space age uh, outer space background but your background is like an actual real place background yeah. that looks very that looks very nice it looks like you're it looks like you're in a James like a James Bond like a secret spy person's like house <laughs> I had this great big table that took up my whole living room and I kept telling my sister I want one of these little tiny skinny things she goes, no, don't do it. And I found one I can eat there. I can use it as a desk. If I just go like this and knock everything off of it, I can eat there. And it's everything. I can, it's a desk, it's a table, it's, it's de decoration. It's gonna hold my Christmas tree. <laughs> That's a, what is it? It's like, is it wrought iron? Is that adamantium? What is that? It's wood and it's been painted silver. Well, you, you did a good job with the, uh, the silver paint because I was 100% convinced that that was something very, very heavy and very <laughs> metallic. But yeah, it's a, it's a good look. Thank yeah, I get, you. I get it really, it, my scarf really accents it well, don't you think? I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, the scarf, the scarf goes with the, uh, the flower, flower arrangement as well. Yeah, uh, right there. I painted this picture. Okay. Yeah, that's really nice. How long have you been doing like uh, watercolor? Is, it, is that watercolor? It might be presumptuous or is it oil? It's, it's oil. So I ordered a picture just like it without all of this in it. And it's in my bedroom and it didn't come on time. So I called Walmart and they sent me the identical one again and didn't charge me and said, keep it. So I wound up with two. So I said, I don't want two identical. So I just got out colors and started making this one look different than the other one. Okay. All right. And that's, that's how pretty you cool. cheat. Hey, well, it works. Yeah. <laughs> how, how long you been doing that? I never have done it ever. Never had the confidence. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah. It, yeah, it works. It definitely yeah. works. Yeah. So like, let's, uh, 
Let's get to know Robbie Aces. I met you, like we talked about before going live, I met you standing in line at the best mic there ever was in Vegas that I knew about, Rob, at the Rebar Lounge in the Arts District. And that yep. was the best mic. And then the pandemic hit. So here you are, kind of sort of post pandemic now, and you're traveling and you're from Vegas. Talk to everybody, speak to how the Vegas shutdown affected you personally and professionally and how you're getting through it all and what you've done to cope and, and get through it. Uh, yeah, sure. So the, uh, it was kind of, it was kind of interesting because I, <laughs> I think I was, I was kind of, uh, I was, I was one of those like paranoid people ahead of, ahead of uh, everything shutting down. So like I had like, I told uh, family members, like once I thought I could say something without sounding like a crazy person, like all the way back, like at the beginning of, uh, of January, I was like, all right, just in case, start like stocking up on things, you know, just in case something happens, if nothing happens, at least you have extra food for like, you know, rainy day, but just in case. So I was like, as far as like that, that stuff, like I, I guess I was pretty well, well prepared, but um, kind of uh, sort of uh, hyped myself up on the, uh, on like how awful like things were gonna be. Like I literally thought that it was gonna be uh, uh post-apocalyptic and and then it wasn't it was uh you know you obviously there was yeah i mean it was it was uh if if it was an if it was like a uh like an apocalyptic movie type of thing it probably would have gotten a five out of ten it's kind of a mediocre apocalypse <laughs> it really was it's like because uh you don't expect that uh that during an apocalypse you'll still be able to uh to, to go to the drive-in at McDonald's at like one in the morning. And that was, you know, the, so uh, kind of underwhelming in the apocalypse department. So, uh, and I was still working a, I was still working a, a day job when, uh, when everything locked down. And uh, that was, uh, that was kind of a blessing of everything because that day job went away. Uh, like you know, I uh, I uh, I worked a, I worked a, a job that it actually because I was in New York before, and it was this job um, that relocated me to Vegas is how I ended up in Vegas um, initially, and um, when uh, things first locked down, like I was one of uh, several managers at this place, like who through the course of like the first few months of everything being crazy and locked down, like, you know, I got, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm not going to say the name of the place because, because I don't know if that, that, uh, that would, that would uh, put me afoul of any, anything that I may or may not have signed at any point whatsoever. But, um, you know, that was a weird time because they uh, like a lot of places were, in a spot where they're like, okay, we need, you know, we need this, we're going to need to start like letting people go. And so having to uh, kind of find out who are the people that, and this was a weird thing too, because I had to make some of those phone calls to people that like, that like reported to me and tell them that they were no longer going to have a job. And that really sucked. And then, uh, during the course of everything, uh, I ended up being eventually being one of those people that someone had to tell me, uh, like was no longer be no longer going to be working there anymore. And that ended up being, being a, a big blessing for me as far as like comedy stuff is concerned, because, um, I've been working with, uh, this, uh, book of manager, Ron Heron since, since when I was living in New York and, give me like a lot of opportunity to grow a lot of development opportunities like in comedy you know can't thank him enough and uh you know when I told him that this job went away like his response was like 
you know, well, the hell, the hell with those people. You want to go out on the road? Like, I'll, I'll leave you out there as long as you want to be out there. So, like, I immediately had an opportunity to be out, you know, on the road. Um, and this was like uh, uh, between, like, I got some, got some things with him in, in August of, of last year. And then I was out for um, a, a part of September and then pretty much most of October and most of November of last year at a time when there wasn't a lot of uh, comedy going on for anybody. And that was, you know, that was a beautiful thing um, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, one, cause you know, it's, it's, it's validating, it's validating their like travel to, you know, a whole bunch of different States and uh, you know, realize, Oh yeah. Okay, this joke works in Nebraska, and it also works in Wyoming, and it also works in Indiana, and this joke also works in Texas, and it works in Illinois, and it works in, uh, you know, Alabama, like all of these places. So it's like, you know, it's validating as a comic, you know, because you can get, you can you can get like a sense of things like within whatever the scene is in you like your hometown, but um, that's not always gonna. 100 percent uh be the same when you know when you're on the road and so going on the road and then finding like oh yeah the these these jokes these are these jokes work in all these other places and people laugh the same if you're (laughs) if you're funny right if you if you have things that are funny like people laugh uh generally like the same anywhere right and so that was validating that was very you know very useful um and uh also just like kind of having a different perspective on just how massive the country is how beautiful it is and uh you know how the people are in all these places that had never been been to before um all of those were tremendous blessings of you know of last year with uh, things locking down, which, you know, I wouldn't have expected to, you know, to happen. And, you know, um, I've continued to be able to, you know, to, to work um, doing those, those brewery and winery tours that, uh, that uh, Heron Entertainment does um, since that time. And, and, you know, it's a hell of an education, you yes. know, in, in comedy I- to do the road. So would you say that your comedy has really grown in a certain specific way or two because of working through the pandemic and doing comedy and winery tours around the country with hair and entertainment? Uh, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cause you know, like you don't get it. Like some some things like you you'll watch like comedy specials of like people that you admire and you love or hear them talk about stories of of the road and granted (laughs) my road experience is not the experience of like you know these these super big big name type type of guys per se but um the road uh the road gives you stories because you have different experiences than than you would just uh you know going back and forth from your apartment in you know the city where you live you know so that's definitely helped a lot um definitely uh you know and and you get to you get to work on an act right versus um you know sometimes if you're if you're doing uh if you're doing shows uh say you know just in you know say in your city maybe you've got you got 10 minutes maybe you've got 15 minutes but having an opportunity to kind of like grow and develop a trust with like people you're on the road with and with, uh, you know, who, who it is that's sending you out on the road and actually being able to be like, okay, here's actually how this, this joke works better uh, with this thing because there's something thematic there. Here's how the transitions work better. Like it helps you to really, you know, create an act uh, being on the road like that, you know, in, in a way, in a way that, would take you longer to do just being stationary, I think, um, in just one place. So for it sure. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. So 
while you've been on the road with Heron Entertainment through the pandemic till now, have you bumped up against some people whose names we would know in the comedy world? Oh man, I I wish I could I wish I could say that there were that there were uh, big 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 names um, of uh, of that sort that that I could mention that I'd that I'd uh, run into as yet and had a chance to like say perform with her or something like that, um, but uh, you know. I'm still like in the grand scheme of in the grand scheme of things like I'm I'm uh this is uh six years in going into I guess seven years in it'll be it'll be next year so like in com like in stand-up comedy years I feel like that's still like baby land you know because uh, there's people uh you know I've I've uh had different people say yeah like when you're 10 years like after you're 10 years in is when like you can start to expect certain things to happen and for you to sort of have certain things click um for you so like from that perspective i'm i'm still a baby in things i guess the closest thing to like big names like that was like pre-stand-up um back in uh when i was still doing a sketch and improv in new york um, at the Magnet Theater, they had a thing called the Tiny Spectacular, which was like their, uh, it was like their Saturday night, like main stage, uh, big show. And at that time, um, I was also, I was also teaching uh, improv classes for them. And uh, one of the guys who was the owner, of the, who was a co-owner of the theater at that time, a guy by the name of Ed Herbstman, who's like a total genius. Um, and uh, he, uh, he actually ended up somehow uh, becoming friends with Mike Myers through through like uh, I want to say it was through like the uh, like the Fri like the Friars Club or something something like that. But he ended up being friends with Mike Myers, and I I got invited to this uh, this like private thing at this place in New York that Mike Myers happened to be at, and then later. Mike Myers uh, ended up performing in this uh, tiny spectacular improv show over there at the Magnet. Um, he would just drop in randomly over a period of, I'd say it was probably like a six month period where he did that. So I got to do a show, an improv show with Mike Myers, which was wow. pretty freaking cool. And a uh, super, super humble guy, like the nicest, sweetest, like most humble dude. Like I remember he, he got there like he got there late one of one of the saturdays and he was he was so apologetic about it like no like no hollywood ego or like oh, you know oh. i was the wayne's world guy i was austin powers none of that stuff like he was like it was it was so interesting to see because he was so contrite about it because to him it was like this is not a thing that you do is to show up late you know oh. you know for a show um and everybody was, you know, like to see like the other performers uh, and uh, like Ed Herbstman, what, uh, who I mentioned earlier, like just being like, it's, it's all right, Mike. We, you know, we know, you know, it's, it's, you know, because I think he had some traffic issues. So there's something going on at home, whatever. You know, everybody was like, it's totally fine. And but he was like, he was he was genuinely upset about the fact that he'd like gotten there late like just like a few minutes before like the show started and i'm like i'm like that was not something that i expect like who would have thought you know how how would you imagine that like like a, like a person like mike myers would just be like a normal person but he is you know and that's a big yeah. lesson too you know they're just normal people it's so great when you run into people who are, have arrived and they're humble it restores your faith in humanity, at least in the comedy scene. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a pretty cool, that was a pretty cool, uh, you know, experience to have. And yeah, that so was you, a huge lesson too. Yeah, so let's go back in time. That's what sure. I like. I like getting a DeLorean and a flux capacitor and I like going back in time. And uh I think it's something about being a baby boomer. I don't know. But the thing is, is that you're from New York. So let's talk about Robbie Aces 
in school, grade school, high school, college, whatever. When did you realize you're funny? Who noticed it? Who encouraged it from as far back as you want to go? Um, probably, probably from, from childhood, actually. Um, though, like, uh, I think, I think other, like, I almost felt like a space alien, like for, for a period of time as a little kid, because I would do things and I recognized that they were funny to other people. And then I, and then I kind of like understood, okay, this would be funny, but it wasn't necessarily like for, there was a period of time where I was like, okay, but I don't like the ha 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 part, like internally to me, like, like, was it there? I was like, okay, this is a thing, but I don't know why it's a thing, but it's a thing. Um, so that was pretty early, probably, probably like when I was like four or five. Wow. And then I remember, uh, my dad was, um, he was a big fan of like, uh, of Steve Martin and he had, he had the wild and crazy guy album with like King Tut on it. And I just remember, uh, being a little kid and, uh, like sitting, sitting with him on my parents' bed, like listening to that album that like, that would be like bonding time. Yes. And then, um, my mom used to be big into the uh like the what what were those specials that they used to they used to have those like comedies like marathon specials for like for like uh the homeless they had like billy crystal and like robin williams and like whoopi goldberg like hosted these things like every year like and, live uh, aid it was yeah it was something like it was something like that but like it was all like comedians mm -hmm. uh, i don't know if you i don't know if you remember this thing but yeah. like i was yeah i was way like way way little and my mom like loved those so so then that that became a thing and then uh then i guess uh yeah from there like in uh high school like for some reason i started watching uh uh saturday night live reruns on like nick at night and like that that like that original cast with like, yes. you know Chevy Chase and John Belushi and like Bill Murray and those guys, and then they would show uh, SCTV with like John Candy and Martin Short like immediately right after that. It's like at night, like like at a what was it like 10 p.m. at night, like on weeknights. And my dad would let <laughs> my dad would let me stay stay up to watch that because it was a thing to do with him as well. Wow. Um, and then uh, yeah, and then my mom took me to see. Uh, the comic, um, I don't want to butcher his name because I haven't thought about this in so in so long. Uh, the guy that was, he had a sitcom called Hanging with Mr. Cooper. I want to say oh, yeah. it's Mark Curry. No, Mark Curry. I think, I think that's his name, unless it Mark Curry is. Been, yeah. It is. Uh, but I remember seeing some, some clip of his like on cable that, that I just thought was hilarious. And I can't even tell you ex what exactly that clip was, but then um, he ended up he ended up doing a show um, somewhere at a like at a college, and my mom actually like drove me there, and like I saw I saw that I saw that I saw him uh, do his uh, stand up show live, like at some at some college, you know, with my mom, and and that was like okay, so that's all the that comedy background you know kind of background stuff and then um then uh in, i guess uh the improv thing was uh i guess the influence of you know saturday night live reruns sctv reruns and then um i was on a college campus board and uh somebody had put a flyer on the sidewalk for auditions for an improv group and uh i was like i'm not doing anything so i showed up and auditioned for that and got into this this inc improv group and then you know the rest of the comedy stuff comes you know goes from there wow you just explained it i was just gonna yeah. say how did you go from enjoying watching comedy to improv yeah wow 
And, so the uh, very first time you performed improv and the very first time you did stand up, what was that like for you? How nervous? How did it go? Let's go back to that. Um, yeah, the first time the first time doing improv uh, was uh, was kind of nerve wracking because because um, it was like a college group and the the guy that ran it was just like another college like he was just another like, college kid um and i thought he knew what he was doing but then later <laughs> later once i once i got formal training it was like okay well he kind he kind of sort of did but we weren't all that good <laughs> like but we were just the one group of people that was doing this you know doing this thing you know um but it was yeah it was nerve-wracking and it felt it felt kind of like back to like being four or five where we, like at times like like especially when I first started doing improv where I was like, okay, they're laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> like, I don't know why this is funny. I guess it is funny <laughs> because they're laughing, you know? So it was kind of like a deja vu, like a flashback sort of, sort of to like being a little kid when I first started doing improv. And then uh, once like you learn the rules and like the basic stuff of like, you know, yes and, and you know, thinking backwards, okay, what did I already do? What can I bring back, like callbacks, you know, how can I heighten this funny thing that I did, then, you know, then it gets, uh, you know, then it can get better, you know, and then wow. that, uh, then later that, that helped with joke writing, because a lot of, you know, a lot of joke writing, I mean, to me is, is sort of that same thing. Okay, so what's a funny idea? All right. So how do you heighten that funny idea? And like, you know, so that's kind of to me is similar to to uh, putting tags on jokes, you know, and then uh, I like calling back to things, you know, within a, within a set, you know, um, that's as satisfying to do in stand up as it is in uh, improv or sketch. So. Yeah. So what. I sat with you one day at a coffee shop. I got invited by another comedian here in Vegas to sit with you. And we were, the purpose was to write jokes. And I got to see you write jokes and come up with them on the spot. And I, it blew my mind away with what you were coming up with. So I assume that you're intelligent and you're able to articulate the intelligence and make it relatable. So do you want to speak to the ability, the high abil ability of intellect that you have on Reservoir that you tap into? And how do you make being so brilliant and so smart so relatable? That's a difficult thing. <laughs> you, are, you are flattering the shit out of me, Linda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, well, I've seen your writing. I mean, it's, it's just brilliant. Thank you. Um, Anybody can do a dick joke, but you write really smart material and you come from a very ethereal, you know, and yet you connect with people's hearts. How do you make technical stuff so really? I don't know how you do it. You're just, how do you do it? Oh, uh, man. Well, I guess. Uh, I mean, one piece, I guess one piece, like just to kind of go back to, you know, to the, to the improv stuff um, is uh, it's like, you know, the whole uh, sort of like the ethos, a lot, a lot of folks like from the long form, like long form improv kind of community with, you know, its roots in like Chicago with Del Close and stuff like they'll, they'll talk about like, you know, truth and comedy, right? And um, so I think that's, that's kind of, you know, kind of part of it. Like you can be, you can be truthful, you can be truthful within like, you can be truthful by being super, super obvious, you know, about uh, something that, you know, some, something that's going on or, or something that like everybody feels, right? Like a lot of times as a, huge relief especially for people that like are watching folks do some you know whatever kind of you know performance like it's like oh my god like 
there's the laughter of recognition of like, I've totally had that feeling before. And just the fact that someone's obviously stating it so obviously and plainly, uh, a lot of times is, is a way to, that you have truth in comedy and it's gonna immediately be relatable and make like people laugh, just like just the release of recognition of like, holy shit, yeah, I, I relate to that and that's, and somehow that's, that becomes funny, like, you know, in a different way than like relating to like some like dramatic movie or something, but it, you know, would be relatable. Um, and then the other, I guess the other way to do uh, truth and comedy is just you know you can uh, have like res absurd ridiculous you can have absurd ridiculous like situations or like talk about like really absurd ridiculous ideas um, but with it with with at the same time basically uh, conveying something that's true about like like human behavior or how you know how people emotionally respond to shit you know so i think that's probably you know that's probably uh two of two of the things that that i try to do um with writing uh which goes to that like truth and comedy kind of thing so i think that's probably that's probably a uh, a big uh, a big chunk of it right so there. like you know i sat with you and within a less than a half hour you had something so brilliant that you came up with on the spot and so like like i, I know you're an improv person so could we play a game where i toss a subject and and you come up with something so people can see how brilliant you are Oh boy, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, sure. Let's 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 see, let's, uh, let's see how it happens. Okay, so let's, if let's you don't if sometimes. you don't like the prompt, tell me to get a different <laughs> tell me to get a different one. So like uh, people wearing glasses, anything about that. Okay. All right. So uh all right, so people people wear people wearing glasses makes me think about uh, you know different different personality types and 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 how diff like the different reasons why those personality types would actually be wearing glasses and why they wear the glasses the way that they do like you know there's there's uh so <laughs> right there like there there's there's a certain way there's a certain way that people wear glasses to like kind of convey that like like they want you to believe that that they're way smarter than you you know <laughs> even if even even if they're not you know or just to like convey that just to convey that like they believe that whatever you just did or said was the stupidest thing in the world and you should be ashamed of yourself you know like 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 you could be at the like you know like you could be at the dinner table with with like a family or something for thanksgiving and like some like people are people are talking about like whatever some stupid tv tv show that's on and uh let's say like right uh the uh what's the one where what's the one where they where uh they they have like the celebrity panel of people and random people come out dressed as like toucan sam and like freaking like like space aliens and stuff and you're supposed to you're supposed to like uh this is like a hit tv show right <laughs> with uh, like Nick Cannon hosts this thing and you're supposed to you're supposed to like be super excited about the mystery of who is this singer who is a celebrity that's underneath this like ridiculous mask and like they always play it up like it's going to be some amazing person like like everybody that's there is going to they're like oh my god I it's totally Beyonce it's totally Beyonce underneath the two can underneath the two can mask right the like the mystery singer, whatever the hell this show is, right? The mass singer. Then, right, the mass singer. And then <laughs> and then it's never Beyonce. It's like, oh yeah, that lady, that lady that was on three episodes of Glee. And then the panel has to pretend like they were like they're so excited that it was her. Like they don't give a shit that it was her. They wanted it to be Beyonce. Everybody that's there is waiting for the day when it's Beyonce underneath the toucan hat. 
but instead it's like the lady that did a cameo on Glee a few times, right? Like, and this is a major like TV show that people are like incredibly like, like are excited about this. Millions of people watch this ridiculous, stupid TV show. And so you could be at a Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's talking about like how amazing that, or did you see it? It was, remember, it was, it was that guy who was fifth runner up on America's Got Talent five years ago. He was underneath the elephant head, right? And you're like, personally, I think that's a stupid show. And then someone will just be like, what do you watch? Right? They just like do that with the glasses. And all of a sudden, you're the stupid one. Right? <laughs> like, they're not stupid for thinking that this ridiculous, dumb TV show like, is, is like worth spending 30 minutes of your life weekly to watch. Like, just that, oh, what do you watch? You know, <laughs> immediately you're the stupid one, right? Oh, that's so that's great. Yeah, so that's a uh, that's that's a trick people do with glasses, and that's like that's a that's like conveys something, you know, through the glasses, right? Uh, yeah. Like that's a, and then there's uh like, as far as like personality types, like there's the, <laughs> there are, like shit, like last last night at last night at the World Series, like the guy, uh, the guy that was they had this guy uh, Alvarez I think was was the guy's name or cast I, I, I don't remember the last name of the pitcher but he was, I think he was he was a pitcher for the Braves for like two innings maybe and the guy had it looked like he had sunglasses on on the pitcher's mound like that's a specific type of guy right that's like it's not enough that you are pitching in the World Series right <laughs> like uh like that's already like you would think that's cool enough like to walk out on the pitcher's mound and have like a pair of glasses that if they weren't sunglasses they were intentionally meant to look like he was wearing sunglasses at night on the pitcher's mound <laughs> during the world series like game four like that's a specific person that's like that's like you know they may not put me up on the mound for the rest of this series so i just want to make sure that i'm memorable you know like, I, I may not strike out a single person, but they are going to remember that, uh, you know. So that's a whole different uh, type of type of uh, person with glasses. Um, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm waiting for like, uh, and this this is not like personality types per se with, with glasses, but, um, you know, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them to be. I'm waiting for there to be like a uh, just a pair, just a pair of glasses that are exclusively for like uh, for for like terminally narcissistic people, where when you put the glasses on, all you see is the best possible image of yourself. That's you know <laughs> specifically like you you would also it would also have to come with like a like an automatic like a like motor scooter for like for that person to get on because there's no way that they would not be able to like it, it, there's no way they wouldn't get in an accident if they were in the sunglasses like these glasses but like uh yeah glasses for narcissists where you put them on and all that you see is just the best image of yourself or maybe it makes everybody or maybe it just makes everybody else look like look like that person you know <laughs> you know um Someone's gonna make those those glasses at some point. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So that that's some stuff that came to mind. Oh my gosh! See what I mean, you guys? This is Robbie Aces. Did you see him do that? Just like that? He's brilliant. Oh my gosh. So let's talk about you went through and you did improv. You transitioned to comedy. You're now on the hair and entertainment wine winery tours. Um, I know there's another word and an ampersand in there. What is it? Hair and entertainment blank and blank. So he uh, so so hair and entertainment does uh, winery comedy tours and then they do brewery comedy tours. So they're That's they're like what they yeah they, it's what they sound like. So um, uh, comics comics traveling across the country to uh, wineries and breweries all over the country. Uh, doing comedy which is an awesome place to do comedy right is uh uh comedy and drinks uh they basically go together 
Yeah. What's the funniest thing that's happened while you've been out touring? Um, man. So, you know, weird, hard, stupid, scary, anything like that. No, um, no. Well, I did, a, I was, a, I was featuring, I was featuring for, I was featuring for somebody um, last year um, and we were in, we were in Dillon, Montana, and uh, this uh, obnoxious couple. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're an ob this obnoxious couple, and and I guess they were probably like the known uh, local town couple that have a drinking problem together. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like I'm a drunk, you're a drunk, let's be in love. You know. Is like one of those relationships, um, and they so they 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 uh, they talked through a good chunk of my set, which was okay, uh, you know, whatever, but not too terribly obnoxious. But then when the headliner went up, then they got uh, kind of even more obnoxious because it wasn't even that they were heckling; they were just it was as if uh, the comedy show was. Uh, just their background music which you know sometimes happens but but every you know like because that'll happen at like mics like like you know like at noreen's like you know uh, or or some of some of the other mics in vegas um and that's a great <laughs> that's a great learning process and a humbling device because uh sometimes at those mics uh the uh the stand-up uh thing that's going on is like just the background noise for whatever special episode of the TV show is of the uh, drunk people at the bar, right? So, but the difference was this drunk couple, like they were the only people that uh, were treating the show as like, you know, background. Everybody else was there, wanted to see the comedy show. And this, uh, this guy gets up uh, in the middle of the headliner set and he yells at, these, uh, at, at this drunk couple and then essentially ends up like throwing him, throwing him out. And at first, like the headliner was like confused. He's like, what is going on? Like, and he, like, you know, he, he, he made, he made a couple of jokes about, uh, you know, about this, uh, bald guy that, that was in, that was in the audience that stood up and like was yelling at them. Um, but then like it came, be, things kind of got really clear. And so what it was is that this guy was actually the town's attorney this guy was the local attorney for the town and he was so upset at these two drunks this drunk couple that like he he couldn't contain himself any longer and he he removed them from from this from this brewery show and then it was like and then he bought a then he bought drinks for the headliner after the fact and like uh -huh. super super nice guy but it was like yeah the town attorney was like enough's enough like you guys gotta go like that was pretty pretty interesting you know can you see this couple checking into aa afterwards and then they're going around the room asking why people are there and they have to say that they were thrown out by the town attorney yeah like i i hope they did i hope they did go to an aa, AA meeting after that I, I, I hope, I hope they ended up getting mandated, <laughs> like, like maybe, uh, you know, the, if the town attorney and the, and the uh, local, uh, the local sheriff or like, uh, you know, poker buddies or something. I hope that happened. But <laughs> that couples was like that, that should have to have ankle bracelets connected to each other and see what it's like to be a conjoined adult twin. Oh, yeah. Oh, it. it and the best part too, like as they were as they were uh, leaving, like they, like they say to the headliner as if this would be like a dig dig at him. They're like they're like, yeah, we 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 like the New York guy better. But it was it was like it was so ridiculous because they were talking during me too. So it was it was not like it, you know what I mean. It was just funny. It was, it was oh my very, god! Very 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 ridiculous. Uh, pair of human beings um so yeah that was 
that was interesting and odd. Um, then, uh, let's see, what, what else? What else has been kind of... Uh, I mean, I guess I had a... I guess I, I had a, you know, sort of veils, like veils, uh, scales, whatever you call them, scales dropped from my eyes. Like um, I was, uh, I was on the road with uh, Randall Thompson, who, you know. Yes. Love and him. Uh, yeah, he's, he's probably like the most, he's probably the most talented, like, uh, like naturally talented person um that um i've i've met in, um in the last uh like five years probably like wow. um yeah he's yeah uh, he's he's up there for sure um he's very special his comedy is so special and he's uh like he's you know uh he's almost kind of like a, he's almost kind of like a Bill, he, he's kind of like a, like a Bill Murray spirit within Vegas to me, you know, because like you hear these Bill Murray stories, um, or like Bill Murray, Bill Murray kind of lives an improv life. Like Randall has a little bit of that, that spirit, you know, to him in terms oh, of, cool. yeah, in terms of how, how he operates. But, you know, we were, uh, we were we were on the road, um, and we had like this crazy long. We had this crazy long drive for. Uh, we did a gig in Flagstaff, um, Arizona, at a at a meadery, which was super super cool. Um, those those people were pretty great. And then we had a really really long drive. It was going to basically be like nearly about a like a. Uh, I want to say like a 22 hour drive um, from Flagstaff to a gig in Mississippi. And uh, we, uh, we pulled into, like we pulled, we pulled into uh, the, the uh, like this, this hotel where we were, we were going to be staying like, but it was super, super late. It was probably like, like uh, two in the morning in some place in New Mexico. Uh, I know it's I know it's a major city in New Mexico, but uh, it's I've uh, I think I've subconsciously erased the name of it from my mind. Because <laughs> every time every time I every time I relate this like <laughs> this like uh, this uh, occurrence I I just blink on the name, but we roll into the, like the front of this, uh, you know, of this uh, ho hotel, like two in the morning, something like this. Uh, we go to the front, like the security guy is in the front sitting on like the shitty park bench that they sometimes have in the front of like the, like hotels and stuff. And he literally immediately looks like he's about to pull out his gun. As if like, what do people go to the, like, what do people drive to the front of like hotels for, you know, it was, it was very, it was very bizarre. And so like, like, like I get, like I get out of the car and, and he, uh, he's like, he's like, well, what are you here for? I'm like, well, we're here to check in. Like, cause a lot of places, like when you're on the road, like you can check in at like two, three in the morning. And at this place, he's like, uh, Everybody left at 10. I'm like, like, what do you mean everybody left at 10? Like, this is a, you know, like, this is a hotel. Like, all, all this, like, started to get very weird. I'm like, and he's like, no one's going to be back until uh, uh, 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. It's like very weird. And I'm like, well, we have a reservation. He's like, well, I didn't see any names on the reservation list. I'm like, well, you have keys right your security you can he's like uh i don't have keys to get you into the, like the hotel it's like so you just camp out like these people leave at 10 and they just say like cool carl uh you know have fun sitting on this bench until we return at six in the morning like 
This is totally bizarre. And then he fake pretended like he was uh, writing shit down, which he didn't write down and fake pretended to walkie talkies, some message and clearly wasn't walkie talking anybody is weirdest freaking thing. Uh, yeah. Needless what the to heck say. happened? Did you eventually get your room on? So we, we ended up, we ended up, uh, we ended up, cra- we ended up crashing and we ended up crashing in the car and then, uh, then uh uh yeah i woke up at like i think like 6 30 ish so after the people were back and whatever so apparently what had happened is all of their computer systems had gone down which was also very weird it was just yeah it was just an odd uh just an odd turn of events and uh like even when i walked in i was like okay well uh are the systems back up now? They're like, no, they're not back. Like, like it was so, it was, I'm like, how are you a functioning hotel? I don't, I don't understand. And then there was like an Illuminati diner, uh, like half a block away with the massive owl on, on the top of it. So I'm like, okay, maybe this isn't an actual like hotel. Maybe this is like a front for something else. You know, I don't know maybe maybe that wasn't even like an actual real security guard maybe it was like the hired the hired henchman for like an eyes wide shut party that was going on like inside that establishment the night before you know it was was weird oh my gosh it sounds like somebody could have a conspiracy theory if this place even existed (laughs) yeah 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 it's uh that is crazy. So what are your plans for the rest of your life in a nutshell in your life? What do you want to accomplish off stage? And what do you want to accomplish on stage? Uh, golly. Um, well, they're kind, of, they're kind of, you know, I mean, they're kind of intertwined. Um, okay. Because uh, I uh, would like to not... I would like to not ever have to go back to a day job, um, you know, like to uh, just uh, be able to uh, spend the rest of my life making a living from uh, doing comedy. You know, that would be nice. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't need to be a rich person. I just, uh, if I don't owe anybody any money and I have enough, you know, just to, you know, kind of live and, you know, maybe, maybe find a, find a nice lady, you know, start a, start a family, you know? Yeah. Uh, that would be nice. You know, just, you know, just enough from comedy or comedy writing or something in that sphere to like be able to support that and have like that kind of life that, that would be the goal for me. Um, and then, yeah, on, on stage, uh, on stage stuff would be, um, uh, I'd uh, yeah, I'd love to be, I'd love to still be doing it, um, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now, um, and be respected by like people that I respect in you know in comedy, you know, again like, I, I don't have like ambitions to you know per se to be like kevin hart or something like that you know um yeah for me it's like is like if if the people like kevin hart in comedy know and respect what i do then that's good enough I, you know don't, don't need to be a household name or anything like that you know yeah. so that's I wouldn't be surprised if you become a household name because you're a comics comic and you're a thinking man's comic. Oh, shucks. Thank you. Appreciate that. There's not a lot of people that I think are like you on stage. And I'm so glad that I got to open you up like a little flower and, and give you time to show people your talent. Because when you went into the glasses thing, that's what I see on stage when I see you at a mic or show. I see you doing some kind of brilliance and you just displayed it right here in front of our eyes. 
Ah, shucks. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And so what I'd like you to do is when we get off of here, type all your social media and all your upcoming or your website where people can find out where to, to see you around the country with Heron Entertainment, brewery and winery tours. And can you cool. tell verbally, could you tell everybody what your social, best social medias are to book you or to see you or follow you, yeah. help your career? Yeah, awesome, appreciate it. Yeah, uh, Robbie Aces underscore standup on Instagram. Uh, that would be uh, the preferred social media thing. Um, Classy Hooligans, that's the YouTube channel uh, with uh, Randall and some other uh, really, really uh, funny uh, Las Vegas people as well, like um, Bruce Leonard and Bruce Purcell and uh, Park Tig and uh, uh, Luella Chavez and Brian Barasa and uh, uh, golly, yeah, uh, other folks. Um, as well that are super awesome. So Classy Hooligans on YouTube. And then uh, the uh, website is vanillatino.com. That's your vanillatino.com. Yep, because I'm a, a half Colombian, half Irish, so I'm a vanillatino. Oh, okay, I get it. So what would you like to say in closing? You can have up to five minutes to cover anything that I didn't ask, that we didn't cover, that you want to tell people, maybe how to be nicer people, how to be better comics, pet oh peeves, anything you want to close, you get to close out the show. Um, golly. Uh, I guess we'll go back to uh, like an old um, uh, kind of an, like an improv and sketch thing that... Um, that uh, I try and, and hold to, which I think is, is useful and helpful, especially like when, um, you know, we can get, we can all get like very comfortable and get, you know, maybe sometimes too comfortable. And then, you know, that's when, uh, and then we all go through like periods where we're like kind of in a low or we're stagnating in whatever, whether it's like creative stuff in life or just, uh, just life in general. And uh, like one thing that uh, that I remember from like the improv years, and and I is like if and actually two things actually because they're related. So one thing, uh, one of one of the uh, one of the teachers, uh, Michael Delaney, over at uh, at UCB used to say, and I don't know if it's something that uh, that he got, you know, he cribbed from like the UCB, the UCB four or it came from Del Close or, or where exactly, but I remember him saying, uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, if you wanna be interesting, be interested. So uh, it's useful to be interested in, in stuff and um, that, uh, you know, they, they would say like, if you, if you start to like, if, you're, if you start to have less fun, uh, in like comedy, then uh, it's probably because you're you need to go and do things to have to have a more interesting life, you know. Wow. So right. So like, so like, uh, like especially like in in like uh, the improv days, like people could get sucked into like being so obsessed with like like improv sketches and shit like that where they like their entire life would be go to your job, go to some improv thing, uh, hang out with improv people, go, go home, go to your job, go to some improv thing, like just that cycle. And it's like, well, then you start to become kind of boring because then that's all that's going on in your life. You're no longer inputting this into your life, the shit that like makes what you do gonna be unique or interesting uh because you're you're not a uh, getting out of your comfort zone so it's like you know read shit you know uh that's an easy 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 way to do it is like read shit like 
read, you know, read books. Um, that's, that's a, that's a dying thing, but like read books, read shit that other people aren't reading just to be like, okay, that's weird. That's wild. Let me read about that. You never know how that can like, you can like connect dots related to that or how that can come up uh, and like inform ideas that you have for like jokes you write or sketches that you're going to do, um, you know, go and go and uh, hang out with some people that you wouldn't in a million years, like have seen yourself hanging out with just for the simple purpose of shaking up your routine and like bringing something different and new, some new energy into your life. Because if you're not doing that, then you will probably start to get boring and what, whatever, whatever you love and have a passion about, you'll start to feel less passionate about. You'll probably start to uh, love it less because you're not, you're not feeding your life with the stuff that, that's going to fuel it and, and keep you creative. So wow. that's, that's what I'd say. That's really encouraging to me. It's I'm sure it's relatable and encouraging to everybody that'll listen. That's beautiful. That's great encouragement, man. Great. That's all I got to say. It was great. Awesome. Thank, thank you so you, thank you. much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, appreciate it tremendously. Um, God bless. Love you God for you. Uh, thinking of me. And, yes, uh, are you kidding yeah. me? So what city are you in today? Uh, today I'm in part, today I'm in parts unknown in, <laughs> that's, that's all I'll say, because I'm, it's not a show day, it's just, just, uh, see, it's just seeing family, but I'll be, uh, back in Vegas, uh, at the end of this week, so. Oh, awesome. Yeah. We'll have fun and safe travels and see you hopefully when you're here in Vegas. Will do. Okay. Thank you so much, Linda. Absolutely. Send me all your social media so I get it right. I don't want to mess that up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And one last plug is, uh, yeah, heronentertainment.com. So, um, you know, so uh, it's, uh, I'll, you know, the road will teach you a lot, you know, if, if you're, you know, willing to be taught. And, uh, you know, there's, there's great opportunities that to be had. So, um, shout out to Heron Entertainment. Heron Entertainment, you picked a good choice here with Robbie Aces. Thank you, Robbie Aces. Thank you. Talk to you later. Talk Bye. to you soon. Bye. Bye.